In official uh, Egyptian state narratives, the story of uh, Egyptian state radio, or ESR, uh, which was inaugurated in May of 1934, is presented as a triumphalist, uh, top-down march towards progress through the airwaves. Uh, an important part of this nationalist narrative was a consciously patronizing attack on the pre-1934 uh, radio era, uh, when around a dozen of independent commercial radio stations predominated in Egypt. The dangers and supposed vulgarity of the unregulated airwaves uh, were emphasized and contrasted with uh, quote-unquote cultured and wholesome entertainment of the ESR uh, after its monopoly of the airwaves in uh, 1934. Aside from these exaggerated negative portrayal of early radio, uh, little is known about the dozen or so private radio stations operating in Egypt from the late 1920s uh, until they were forced to shut down in May of 34. The exaggerating narrative of vulgar commercialism was primarily used to contrast early radio with an equally uncritical positive depiction of uh, state-controlled radio as a national tool of education and cultural uplift. So in uh, this presentation, uh, I will trace the history of some of these early stations. Who were their owners and operators? What sort of programming did they offer? Uh, were they as commercially vulgar uh, as they're represented in the Egyptian historical imagination? Shedding more light on this important early period in Egyptian radio history, uh, will partially fill in an important void in the history of Egyptian media, and perhaps uh, give us a deeper understanding of this transition to uh, state-owned media uh, taking place elsewhere in the Arab world. In uh, 1939, Muharram Ahmed, a young employee of the Egyptian Postal Service, printed a now obscure 88-page booklet where he recounts his firsthand experience volunteering and later on working as an announcer in five of Egypt's private stations. In January of 1932, uh, Ahmed started working in Sabo Radio uh, while he was still in high school, uh, when he was selected to perform uh, bi-weekly theatrical monologues and dialogues on the air. He continued this uh, uh, broadcast for a couple of months until he volunteered to work for the newly established Radio Farouk. Uh, because according to Ahmed, Radio Farouk, that is, had a stronger signal and better programming. Ahmed worked at uh, Radio Farouk for a few months before finding uh, full-time employment with yet another newly opened station. Radio Viola was owned and operated by an Egyptian man uh, named Habashi Girgis. As a former manager of Radio Farouk, uh, Girgis knew Ahmed well and welcomed him to the newly established Radio Viola. Ahmed was a natural uh, behind the microphone and was soon presenting programs and playing records on the air as a makeshift DJ. He would later broadcast his own daily morning show and establish a following uh, among Egypt's growing radio listeners. By 1933, uh, radio in Egypt was taking off as a mass medium and uh, demand for competent radio announcers uh, was increasing. Predictably, after just seven months of working at Radio Viola, uh, Ahmed was approached by some self-styled media investors who employed him along with a fellow announcer uh, and friend named Victor to direct their very own station called Radio Cairo. Uh, radio Cairo, however, only lasted for a few months as Ahmed uh, blamed the unavailability of a telephone at the station's office uh, for the failure of the station. Or as Ahmed uh, eloquently put it, and I quote, the station did not have a telephone. And I can categorically say that the telephone at a radio station is akin uh, to a heart in the human body. For this reason, I felt boredom and restraint for I was not directly connected with any listeners and I could not figure out their minute by minute requests and desires. Though I was receiving 30 or 40 letters a day from all over the country, this was never enough for me. While in the broadcast studio, I felt entirely isolated from the world. Regardless of the real reason behind the failure of Radio Cairo, Ahmed uh, was almost immediately 
uh, recruited as the manager uh, and primary uh, radio announcer for uh, yet another station called Valley of the Kings Radio. Uh, and uh, he worked there until uh, the end of May 1934. You see here on the slide uh, uh, in front of you, uh, a list of, of a few of those uh, private commercial stations uh, along with their owners and their years of operation. By uh, 1933, uh, most of, of these uh, Egyptian private stations had strong enough signals to be heard all over Egypt and uh, beyond. The largest ones regularly advertise their programming in the Egyptian press, including in Lahram. Uh, in some ways, the general programming content of these early stations uh, was similar to what state radio would become later on, except, of course, for the on-air commercials. Uh, recorded live music predominated, and a variety of uh, regular weekly educational lectures and also children's programming were also featured. Uh, many of the owners of uh, Egypt's private radio stations uh, owned their own radio shops that sold and repaired radio sets. In this way, uh, they were doubly incentivized by broadcasting entertainment content that increased the number of listeners, uh, enhancing on-air advertising revenues, and they also encouraged potential listeners to buy their radio sets from their stores. Um, and you can see some examples here of some of these uh, advertisements in La Ram. Uh, one is, uh, was printed in 32 and the other one in 1933. Uh, there are, of course, almost on a daily basis, quite a, maybe a couple or so of those advertisements in Al-Ahram during this time period. But uh, in any case, by 1934, uh, the improving quality and expanding variety of programming of these private stations led to their commercial success. In early May of 1934, uh, the Egyptian government sent certified letters to the dozens or so uh, radio stations operating in Egypt, ordering them to close on May 29, uh, two days before the official launch of the Egyptian state radio. In response, uh, many of the station owners coordinated their efforts and synchronized a strike, silencing all of the radio stations in Egypt uh, from the night of May 18 to the morning of Monday, May 21. On Monday, all of the stations simultaneously broadcast elaborate appeals to their listeners, urging them to petition the government to keep their stations running. The owners and managers of 11 of the stations met regularly at the headquarters of uh, Sabo Radio, and a plan was made to consolidate all of their stations, creating a new conglomerate named the National Union of Private Radio Broadcasters, um, which proposed to operate just two large private stations uh, one in uh, Cairo and the other in Alexandria. All of these efforts, however, uh, were rebuffed by the government. And on May 31, 1934, uh, ESR started its first broadcast and all of the private stations were shut down as planned. Uh, I'm going to start the uh, brief conclusion by reading you a quote by uh, Muharram Ahmed. God bless these long days and nights, for back in those days, radio broadcasting was from and for the service of the people, i.e. our listeners. During these days, people used to turn their radio dials and find at least 11 different stations to choose from. The listeners could change radio stations as they wished without paying a single penny. Long live the days of broadcasting freedom as opposed to the current days of monopoly. As I have noted elsewhere, uh, the Egyptian media landscape up to the first third of the 20th century is best described under the rubric of media capitalism. At the time, most Egyptian media, including of course the commercial radio stations that we just talked about, were privately owned and uh, relied on sales and advertisements. In this media landscape, the demands of the consumers was the ultimate driver of media content. The banning of commercial radio and the state's monopolization of the airways in 1934 marked the beginning of a major shift in the media environment, which not only reduced variety and choice, but also silenced some voices and amplified others. The ESR's programming committee, acting as cultural gatekeepers, regulated the airwaves in their attempts to mold a more homogeneous national culture, while patronizingly calling for a civilizational uplift 
of the masses through radio broadcast. In some ways, this 1934 shift from private to state-controlled radio may have set the perfect model for Nasser's future media nationalization schemes, which by the early 1960s completely shifted the media landscape in Egypt from media capitalism to what I describe as media etatism. Future research, of course, is needed to fully test this hypothesis. Thank you.